So our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. You can turn there. Um, we're, we're beginning a fall series this morning, a fall sermon series, where we will be looking at this first letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica, the first letter that he wrote to that church, which is why the letter is called 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going I'm to read the passage in a second, but, but don't get up yet uh, because I want to take a minute a couple minutes first and sort of set the scene. I think this is important. We're switching up from the summer. We spent the summer looking at the Old Testament prophet uh, Micah. Uh, so we need to take, take a second to just sort of reorient ourselves, figure out where we are. The Bible's a big book. It covers thousands of years of history. It was written by different human authors and different literary styles to different audiences across different periods of, of history. But it has one overall storyline. And you're not going to be able to make, a, make sense out of any of it unless you know where you are in the, in the bigger story. So where are we, where are we in, the, in the big story? Where are we in the, in the Bible? Well, when we come to 1 Thessalonians, we're in the New Testament, which means that we are after the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. The Old Testament, which is where we spent the summer, the Old Testament, all of it, looks forward to the coming of God's promised Messiah, his special Savior, his special rescuer. Now the New Testament reveals that savior to be Jesus of Nazareth, a baby born in Bethlehem to a Jewish mother named Mary and her husband Joseph, a baby born in the royal line of a guy named David, a king in Israel, a baby who would grow up, this Jesus of Nazareth, who would grow up and for about three years, starting around the age of 30, wander around the Roman occupied regions of Jerusalem, Galilee, Samaria, Judea. And he wasn't just wandering, he was teaching. He was teaching about the arrival of God's kingdom, that is God's rule and authority. He was teaching about the people's need for them to turn away from their rebellion against God and trust in God for their, their rescue. Now, this was a pretty big claim that this guy named Jesus was making as he went around teaching these things because he wasn't just making a claim about God and what God required. Jesus was actually claiming to be God, God himself in human person. And this, this upset a lot of people. It upset the Jewish religious establishment because they considered a claim like that to be blasphemy. It upset the Roman occupiers because they considered a claim, any claim of authority uh, to be a challenge to Caesar. And so all this upsetness that these claims Jesus were making, all this upsetness led to his death, which in God's amazing story was all part of his plan, all part of his plan to pay the sacrificial penalty for the sins of, of his people. This was a fulfillment, Jesus' death, even though it resulted immediately from the upsetness caused among the Jewish and the Roman authorities, this was all part of God's plan to fulfill what the Old Testament prophecy said the Messiah would do. And so Jesus died. But of course, he didn't stay dead. History in the Bible tells us. On the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. He spent over a month meeting with his friends and then he returned to heaven to be with the Father after promising to come back to be with his people again, to come back again someday, giving his followers in the meantime a mission to accomplish now Paul kind of narrowing down to first Thessalonians here Paul the main writer of this letter here was one of the people who became convinced in a rather dramatic way in his case that this Jesus really was who he claimed to be and Paul became a powerful leader in the early church he took the message the message of of of, uh, of Jesus he took the mission that Jesus um, gave to his followers. He took it very, very seriously. And he himself went on several missionary journeys to different cities, telling people in those places about the amazing news of Jesus the rescuer, the promised Messiah. And, and actually, in Acts 17, the book of Acts chapter 17, you can read about his visit to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia which probably sounds very impressive, but means probably very little to most modern Americans, certainly. So quick geography, right? We're talking about a city, still exists today, on the northeast side of the Greek peninsula. Right? Now, Greece sticks out, a big peninsula, right? A body of land uh, you know, uh, uh, faced on three sides by, by water. A peninsula sticks out into the larger Mediterranean Sea area, east of Italy, west of Turkey, uh, in Europe. Population at the time of, uh, of, of Paul's writing, probably about 100,000 in this city, tucked away at the, the sort of the northeast corner, right where the peninsula uh, kind of butts into the, the mainland of, of Europe. 
Fairly prominent city at the time, very strategic, natural harbor, which made uh, shipping traffic easy to come in and out of. It was located in, at an intersection of some busy uh, trade routes, both east to west and north, uh, north and south. And Paul's visit to Thessalonica happened on his second missionary journey. He made at least three of them, like I said. And on, on this one, Paul, along with Silas and probably a very young Timothy arrived in Thessalonica and they told people about Jesus there. They started in the synagogue talking to the, to the Jewish people. But Acts 17 tells us that not only did some Jews believe in this Jesus as their Messiah, but a great many Greeks did as well. So you had out of this a small Christian community start, a small church. Now Paul and his fellow missionaries, actually they had to, they had to leave town pretty quickly in a hurry um, because uh, people started complaining that they were inciting a rebellion talking about this Messiah. Now, it wasn't true, but the Romans got upset. Paul and his, his friends had to hightail it out of town. But not long after that, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to check on the new Christians there. Right, he was concerned about them. And while Paul was hanging out for about 18 months in Corinth, another Greek city, Timothy brought the report back from his, from his visit. And he said, Paul seems like they're doing, they're doing pretty well, but they do, have, they do have some questions. They have a little confusion about what happens when they die, about what's going to happen next, about when Jesus is coming back, they probably need some encouragement, need a little bit of better understanding in that area. That was the report that Timothy brought back to Paul. Now, Paul couldn't just jump on a Zoom call with the church in Thessalonica, couldn't send him a you know, few quick snaps or something like that with some words of wisdom. So he wrote them a couple of letters. And the first one, 1 Thessalonians, is what we're going to be studying this fall. All right, so that's your, that's your introduction to, to what we're reading and how it fits into the big, giant sweep of everything. Short as I can make it, but you got to do it. Right, you got to take time to figure out where you are or else everything that we kind of talk about over the next few months aren't gonna, isn't going to make as much sense. Besides, going through that exercise is just a really helpful way of reminding yourself that the Bible is not just a bunch of, you know, kind of wise sayings that you just kind of jump in or plop into, you know, here and pick out a, a pearl of wisdom or something and walk away with. I mean, it has lots of wisdom, but it is a story. And anytime you go into it, you need to understand if you're really going to get the greatest understanding out of it, you really need to understand where you are in that story. So let's, with that as a very long setup, let's, let's stand, let's stretch it out a little bit uh, while I read this, uh, this text from 1 Thessalonians 1. It's just the first four and a half verses. Um, and when I'm done, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord. And I'm going to invite you to respond by saying, thanks be to God. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting at verse 1 and reading through the middle of verse 5. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> now I told you that one of Paul's main aims in this letter is to give a sense of encouragement to this church about the future, about what is ultimately going to happen. And, and, and any confidence or any encouragement about the future has to start with an understanding of, of who you are. And you have to understand who you are first before you understand where you are going. And that's where Paul starts here. I mean, think of it like this. Kids, what happens, kids, what's going to happen next summer? Do you know? It happens every four years. It's something that happens every four years in different cities. Every four years it happens in a different city. It actually started in Greece, the Olympics. The Olympics. Now, who gets to go and compete in the Olympics, right? If you wanna compete in the Olympics, what do you have to be, right? You have to have an identity. What is it? You need to be, it's not a trick question. You need to be an Olympian, <laughs> right? You, and you need to be an athlete qualified to compete in the Olympics. You need to be an Olympian in order to go to the Olympics. And there's no use talking about how great it will be to go and compete in Paris next year in the Olympics unless you are an Olympic athlete. Now, in the same way, Paul is writing to the Christians in Thessalonica to encourage them with confidence about their future, about what's coming up, and how great it will be for, for, for the followers of Jesus. But he starts by offering a definition of a Christian, and that's fairly useful. Right? What is a 
Christian. That's a fairly useful place for all of us to, to start. Even if you're not a Christian, actually, it's a fairly useful place to start. Seems a bit silly, actually, to reject being something when you don't really understand what that something is, especially when the stakes of what Christianity claims are, are, is so high. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about what it means to be a Christian. And you can't really go further in offering someone encouragement of hope until you start with that question. Are you a Christian? And if someone says to you, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, it's never a bad idea to ask, what, is, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? I thought for many years that being a Christian was primarily being in a family that celebrated Christmas and Easter. I would have answered I'm a Christian if someone asked me, are you a Christian? Right? For other people in other parts of the world, it can primarily be an ethnic or a historical or a political identity. Are you a Christian? Right? But that's not what a Christian is. Now, on the other hand, and this may increasingly become the case in America in the years to come, if someone says to you that they aren't a Christian and actually they have no intention of ever wanting to be a Christian, a very good way of continuing the conversation would be to say, you know that term, Christian, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. How do you define what it, what it means? And then listen. Right? Instead of starting to talk and running around, listen, because it's quite possible that what they're rejecting as a definition of a Christian is a definition that you and the Apostle Paul might reject as well. So that's why Paul starts here. It's why we should care. And there'll be plenty of time to talk through the themes of the letter in the next few months. But let's start where Paul starts because he starts by saying that a Christian is someone who has, number one, a new identity that is demonstrated by, number two, observable evidence and is, and, 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 and is a recipient of undeserved grace. That's what a Christian is, someone who has a new identity demonstrated by observable evi evidence that is a recipient of undeserved grace. And those are the points that are listed in the in the bulletin for you. Let's start with a new identity. Look at verse one. And if you've read Paul's letters before, you'll notice this is a fairly standard greeting. It starts with the author or the authors, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. Paul's the primary author probably. The writing matches his style. Uh, without a question, he was the leader of the missionary uh, team here. Sylvanus, which is just a Latin form of Silas, is the same guy, uh, and Timothy. They probably had some input maybe into the letter. Uh, they were probably, um, uh, probably the main scribes, maybe the messengers for, uh, for Paul, so they're listed as well. Now, the identity of the author is important. In any writing, it's important, but it's always important in these epistles as well when it's mentioned. Paul's an apostle. He doesn't feel the need to mention that he's an apostle here like he does in some of his other letters, probably because that wasn't being challenged. But the source of him as an apostle is important because it reminds us that the definition of a Christian is not something that we just make up ourselves. Right, we don't self-define ourselves, right? God defines us, in this case, through an appointed apostle to whom he's given the authority to lead and to, and to teach. But the really relevant part for our purpose of defining a Christian is not the identity of the writer here, but the identity of the reader. See what it says. That is the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick that apart for, for a second. The church, it's a Greek word, ekklesia, which means the ones called out, the set-apart ones. And in Greek, it wasn't just, in the, in the Greek culture, this wasn't just a, uh, it wasn't just a religious thing. It, was, it had a common meaning, referring to any assembly or body where people were selected for a, a role or a function, a local council perhaps, a, a board for, for example. But this, what Paul's talking about, is a special ecclesia. Because this was a church in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes it different from a common Greco-Roman assembly here. Because the members of this assembly are united not by a shared civic interest or shared political function, but they're united by a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of theology there that we don't have time to completely explore, but this is a clear and, and, and very early evidence that Jesus was considered a second divine person of the Trinitarian God, along with the Father mentioned here and with the Holy Spirit mentioned in verse five. What I want you to see, though, is that this is the basis for a new identity. An identity that transcends all other identities. Now that's an interesting message in today's world because we live in a world where we divide up into different identities all the time. Now sometimes there are identities that we're born into, our race, our national origin, our hometown. Sometimes there are identities that we choose, right? By, uh, by avocation, our, our hobbies, right? Someone would say, I'm a fisherman. Others would say, I'm a baseball player. Or we divide into, you know, our professions. I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a pastor, right? Sometimes the identities that we divide up to are, are identities that we're really born into, but we think we can choose because there is this powerful urge to self-identify, 
right? Not let anyone else define you. You choose who you are. You be you, whatever you decide you to be. But here's the problem, the problem with all that. None of those identities will ultimately satisfy you and all of them will ultimately fail you if they are your primary identity. When Paul wrote to the the Galatians, probably around the same time that he wrote this letter, and he said that there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, he wasn't saying that being a Christian erases all of those things, erases your ethnic heritage or your labor status or your gender. He wasn't saying that. He was saying that being a Christian gives you a larger identity, a primary identity. Because he says that in the church, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see what he says? There is an identity that will satisfy your deeper longings, an an identity that will never fail you, and that is your identity in Christ Jesus. Or as Paul sets it here, it's not a contradiction, it's just a fuller way of saying it, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What are your deepest longings? Right? How does this identity satisfy them? Right? I, th- I think our deepest longings can actually be fairly summarized in what Paul offers to the Thessalonians in verse 1. Grace and peace, right? Aren't they the things that we want at the core? Grace, unconditional, unmerited acceptance. To be known and to be loved, to be accepted and cherished. We all long for those things. Peace, right? We all want that too. All right, this is the Old Testament uh, idea of shalom, complete rest, complete contentment, because all is well, <laughs> complete life harmony, everything fitting together, no anxiety, no worry. Who wouldn't want these things? These are our deepest longings. But see, here's the thing. Your sports team won't give that to you. Even the good ones let the fans down. Right? Even the best players reach a day when their declining skill, when, when their physical health, right, mean that they're no longer a part of the team. Right? Your profession won't give that to you. Right? There'll always be someone who's smarter and harder working than you. And even if there isn't right now, there will be because there'll come a time when your strength, when your ability to work hard, it will, it will wane. When you won't be able to do your job as well. Where if you persist in it, you won't pass the performance reviews anymore. Right? And then you're out. It's no one's fault. That's how a sports team works. That's how a company works. If you let them be what they are, then they're good. But if you let them be your identity, then they crush you. They'll never give you the grace and the peace that you deeply long for. But a Christian has a new identity, a better identity. That's point number one. Christian is someone who has a new identity. Now, point number two, it's an identity that results in observable evidence. Look at verse two. Paul says he's incredibly thankful for the Thessalonians. In fact, he's saying he's praying for them and he's thanking God for them all the time. And he's thanking God, he specifically says, by remembering a number of things. Look at verse three. There's a a lot packed in there. What's Paul thanking God for? The work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope, right? Three things. When you have faith, you work it out. Your faith produces evidence, it produces good works, deeds of service to, to others. And he says that's what he thanks God for. They have their, their, their work of faith. And, and the work, he says, is a labor of love. Now, labor is like work, but it's not exactly the, the same thing. Labor is the effort required to do the work. And you have the motivation then here being included as well. Not just the work itself, but the motivation for it, right? Namely, love. The Christian serves his neighbor out of a heart that seeks his neighbor's best, out of a heart of love. Now, the third evidence is steadfast hope, right? Steadfast, a a firm confidence that all things are going to end well, steadfast hope. Not Not because of your own strength, but because of a hope in the victorious, look at verse three, in the victorious Lord Jesus Christ. Now, You see what this means. It means that when a Christian receives a new identity, it means you live differently. It means you have different priorities. It means you speak differently. You don't just, uh, you you don't just look like everyone else, right? You look, you look a little bit different. And as a result, people can't figure it out, at least not initially. One of the earliest evidences that, that this is exactly what happened in the Christian church comes from a second century letter to a guy named Diognetus. Right, now, no one's sure who wrote the letter, but Diognetus was the, the recipient, and he appears to be someone who was investigating Christianity. And his, his friend is explaining in the letter to him how these Christians are just, they're just curious creatures. They're just really hard to figure out. Right? This is what he says. Listen to this. This is what um, this, this writer is saying to Diognetus about these Christians. He says they dwell in their own countries, 
but, but they dwell simply as sojourners, as if they don't ultimately belong there. They, 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 they live as citizens and they share in all things with others, but they endure everything that they have to face as foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry as do others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws in their lives. They love all and are persecuted by all. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They are completely destitute, and yet they enjoy complete abundance. They are reviled, yet they bless. When they do good, they're punished as evildoers, undergoing punishment, yet they rejoice because they are brought to life. Now, there's a lot of back and forth there, but you see that? Isn't that remarkable? One of the defining characteristics of the early church that was noted, ironically, by, by, by the people who weren't Christians, they noted that, that these Christians were much more liberal with their money than their non-Christian neighbors. And yet, simultaneously, much less liberal with their bodies than their non-Christian neighbors. And they had children, this is what the letter was saying, they had children like everyone else, but they seemed to actually care about their children. Right? Rather than kill them when they weren't useful or cramp in their style, right? they loved their children. Right? They lived in the world as if they were good citizens, but they weren't consumed by the world. They were liberal with their money and their food. They gave it out. They shared it with everyone, but they weren't, curiously enough, at the same time, liberal with their bodies and their beds. They upheld a, a dignity of women and sexuality that the world hardly knew or understood. Right? These are the evidences of a new identity. Not perfection, but reoriented and often curiously observable priorities to the people who are watching. Now, that's the second thing, observable evidence. Now, finally, the grounding for all of this, the thing that holds it all together. A, a Christian is someone who has a new identity that is demonstrated by observable evidence and is someone who is a recipient of undeserved grace. This is where Paul's theology becomes clear and where it becomes very practical. Look at verse four. Paul says he gives thanks for the evidence, verse three, of their new identity, verse one, and then he gives the grounding for what holds it all together. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. How? First part of verse five. Because our, how do we know? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now what he's saying is that the ground for our identity as Christians, ultimately, the ultimate foundation for that is that we are God's chosen ones. Literally, the word means elected, people who are selected. Now, in the Greek world, the election or the recruitment of middle, military or political leaders, it was based on merit. It was based on character, at least it was supposed to be, right? In other words, the one chosen for a particular position in government or in military, right, they, they, had, to, they had to work. They had to earn their spot. Now, sometimes, the election to a, a post or a position was instead, uh, wrongly, but instead the result of a favor or a bribe, payment to the person who was making the, the election. In other words, you bought them off. You paid off the, the chooser so that you could be chosen. But Paul means something very different. Whenever Paul talks about God's elect people, his chosen, whether it's here in 1 Thessalonians or it's in Ephesians or it's in Romans, whenever he's talking about that, he's referring to God's undeserved grace. In other words, a Christian's status, a Christian's chosen status doesn't come from any work that Christian does. It doesn't come from any form of religious bribery he might offer, right? And that means two things. It means that God is the one who gives us our new identity. He's the one who does the saving. And this is very good news because we can't save ourselves anyway. No amount of work that we could possibly do would ever, be, would ever be enough. Try as hard as we want. We'll never be good enough. We'll never be able to sustain the perfection that is required by a perfect God. In other words, a Christian identity, this means, is not earned. A Christian identity is given. You don't do anything to deserve it. You don't come to the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus comes to you. And it comes, Paul says, with power. Now, one objection related to this teaching about being chosen is that if okay if you know you're chosen then you've got no incentive to be good which I guess would be true if you misunderstood everything I said in point number two remember observable evidence right the teaching that God doesn't save you because of the good work you do doesn't mean that you don't do good work it means that the good work that you do flows out of your being saved it's your response 
Right, think about it. The unconscious man pulled from the raging sea and certain drowning right, contributes nothing to his rescue. But as a result of his rescue, <laughs> that unconscious drowning man would do almost anything in gratitude for the gift of his life after he has been rescued. Now, if this teaching about being chosen means that God does the saving, it also means that God and God alone gets the credit, which addre addresses the other objection that you often hear when words like this are used sometimes. It goes like this. People says, if Christians think that, that they're chosen, then it will just encourage arrogance in them. You know, they walk around smugly with this air of superiority. Have you seen me? Do you know who I am? I'm among the chosen. Now, unfortunately, we can sometimes, it's, it's all too easy to think of examples like that. People behave like that, but when they do that, they show a complete misunderstanding of what this is actually teaching, right? If you really believe that your identity as a Christian doesn't result from anything that you've done to merit it, if you truly believe that, if you truly believe that God and not you gets all the credit for your status of being a called out one, if you truly believe that, then you will recognize that there isn't anything inherently better about you than any other person you meet who isn't a Christian. In fact, anything that's distinctive about you, any evidence of good works you do, it doesn't come from your power, it comes from God, which means that the one who understands this teaching of being chosen ought to be, this Christian ought to be the most gracious, the most kind, the most patient person that you'd ever meet because they realize that their identity as a Christian it's not something that points to any kind of merit or moral superiority on their own part at all. When this power comes into our lives, it changes us. It gives us a sense of humility and a sense of strength at the very same time. Pavel Mayorov was born in 1922, right, just about 100 years ago. His father, Sergei, had been a Christian but Pavel grew up in a very different era of Soviet communism than his father grew up in, right? State-enforced atheism. Uh, Pavel served in the Soviet army. He retired as a officer. He was a leading member in the Communist Party in his local community. And then his wife and his children came to faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't like it. He wasn't in favor of it. In fact, he actively opposed it. But the thing was is he could not deny the evidence of the change in their lives. They were the same people, but they were different. They had a new identity. And finally, though still fiercely opposed to becoming a Christian himself, he decided to visit a local underground house church. Not in anything that was sanctioned, right? I mean, underground believers. He wanted to go so he could kind of see and hear for himself. And he, when he went into the room and he started hearing about the people talking about Jesus, he knew immediately, I gotta get out of here. I made a big mistake. I gotta, I gotta resist this. I need to leave or I'm not gonna be able to resist it. And he tried to leave. He got up to go. The problem was there were so many people crowded in this room that he physically like couldn't get out. I mean, he could have like hit people and pushed people and stuff, but he wanted to maintain at least some sense of decorum. He couldn't get out of the room. So he sat down and he sat down and he was listening and he started to cry. And he asked God to save him. That was 1977. For 55 years, God had been pursuing him. And God, when he pursues, always wins. The gospel came on Pavel with power, not only in word, but in power. And the Holy Spirit changed his heart, gave him a desire for Christ that he did not possess, that he was not actually even actively seeking, so that Pavel would cry out and receive the gift of eternal life. Now, when that happened, <laughs> when, when that became Pavel's identity, he lost almost all of his earthly identities that had given him any kind of status. His place in the Communist Party, gone. His military pension, gone. His income, gone. He was harassed, he was persecuted. He lost most of what could be taken from someone in this world. But he gained what he could have never earned, what he could have never mer merited. He gained peace and steadfast hope. He gained, by God's grace, what could never be taken away. He was a Christian. Are you? Are you a Christian? And if you are, is this how you would define yourself? Would this, would this definition fit you? And if it's how you would define yourself, would it appear to anyone else that you were at all different? If you were to be put on trial for being a Christian, would the prosecution have enough evidence to convict you? 
Paul is about to unfold in this letter what it means for the church to have a hope that is radically different from the rest of the world, a hope in the future, a hope that begins with your identity as a child of God, an identity for which you can claim no credit, an identity, though, that that makes all the difference for how we're going to live in this world together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it teaches us about who you are and the marvelous, amazing grace that you have shown to us. Lord, we pray that this is indeed, as we've read, how we would define ourselves. That we would define ourselves as Christians, but in doing so, recognize the incredible humility that comes along with it because we can claim no credit for our knowledge and for our understanding. And so, Lord, make us humble. And yet at the same time, Lord, allow this identity and this knowledge of who we are in Christ, allow it to give us a boldness that we can't possibly understand either because there is nothing that this world can take from us that we don't have in even greater measure for all eternity because of what you have done for us. Allow that truth to penetrate deep into our hearts so that as we look to the future, we might be able to look in steadfast hope. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.